Hello, today we're going to have a look at uh, counter circuits. It's in the Electronics 3 prac book. It's the third prac on page 12. So we'll be building this circuit here. And this circuit, it's easiest to build it in two stages. We build this first stage here, which is this buffer that we saw in the uh, previous prac, uh, with a few other different components on the input here, including a switch. And then we're going to add to it this D-type flip-flop circuit, which we're just going to be looking at both the outputs of that flip-flop to, to uh, see, see their effect, or see the behaviour of that uh, flip-flop. So um, I've already got the uh, 4011 chip in from the previous prac. Uh, so now I'm just going to go ahead and build this circuit here. So connecting pin 1 and 2 together. Connecting pin 5 and 6 together. Then connecting the output of, pin, of the first gate, so pin 3, to one of the inputs there, pin 5 or 6. Uh, we might as well see what it's doing, so connect onto pin 4, which is output. With a resistor and an LED. Okay, so this should, yep, you can see that it's uh, giving us that floating input kind of behavior there, which is good. Um, and so now, let me just put that up there, add in the Tinker Hay resistor. And the ten, uh, the ten microfarad capacitor there. So I'm just connecting them onto pin one and two. Notice that the uh, capacitor there is polarized. A little plus on it, it means it's a polarized type capacitor. Uh, you've got to be a bit careful about putting those in back to front because uh, they can actually explode on you if you're not careful. Um, and finally, to complete the switch, I've got my input. And I'll just have another breadboard wire and I'll just touch them together and this should make it light up. Okay. Uh, so the behaviour I would expect out of a circuit like this is that um, when I close the switch, obviously this is a buffer so I'm making the input logic high and the output will go logic high. Um, but the difference between this and without the capacitor is that without the capacitor when I close it, the input can go logic low very, very quickly. And you can see I can get it to sort of maybe register multiple multiple presses. So it would um, go low, high, low, high several times for one time that I actually try to, trying to connect it up. Okay. What the capacitor does is adds a little bit of a time delay between when it goes back to low again. And so now you can see that if I do it a bunch of times, very, very quickly, I, um, I get a more or less a constant output. I can exaggerate that effect. I have to have complete control over the, by, um, by changing the resistor and capacitor value here. And I'll just show you what happens if I make the resistor value 100K. And you can see that when I close it and open it, the LED stays on for about a second. At this time okay and well this is probably going to be a bit too too slow for our purposes um, but it demonstrates the phenomenon pretty well okay so put the 10k back in uh, and so this is called debouncing so what we're doing is we've got a mechanical switch here which in this case is just two bits of wire that we touch together um, and the problem with any mechanical switch is that uh, you can't be sure when you close the switch whether it closes completely the first instant and stays closed. And so uh, if we were to have this into a counting circuit or something else that was being triggered by the output of this gate here going low to high, uh, which is what we will have in a minute, um, then uh, we might register multiple presses when we only press it 
only mean to have it pressed once. So debouncing the switch is a nice easy way that we can we can work with that. Okay, so now we've built our debouncing circuit. And the other reason why we are using, using a, a buffer here is so that the logic level here, which is on the connected to the clocking pin of our D-type flip-flop, we want that to go from low to high extremely quickly. We don't want it to take a little while for it to go high, and we want to be able to control, make sure that it's, um, that it's repeatable and reliable each time. And so the output of this uh, logic gate will do just that. Okay, so we're going to build the, uh, the D-type flip-flop now. So it's the 4013 chip. Okay, so just making sure that connecting my set and my reset here, which are on my, uh, on this uh, pinout diagram, the R1 and S1 are the um, set and reset. Uh, connections they need to be connected to zero volts if not what you might find is that the uh, circuit becomes either unresponsive or changes kind of on its own uh, and that's because that would be because if you didn't have anything connected to them then they're a floating input and uh, just like all the other things before that other inputs that are floating would uh, be triggered by uh, electromagnetic noise and things like that so it'd be very unpredictable so make sure that they're connected to zero. The next thing I need to make sure are connected is the D around to not Q. So I'm using this bottom flip-flop. Notice how it says Q1, Q, not Q1, and clock one and things like that. And then we have all of these uh, other ones along the top here that are this number two. That's because this is a dual D-type flip-flop. We've got two D-type flip-flops in the same uh, integrated circuit. So I'm just using Q1, or flip-flop 1 for the moment. Um, so connecting not Q1 to, to D. And this is blue wire. So it's going to be pin 2 to pin 5. Okay. And Q1, I'm going to use a resistor and LED here. There's my LED, yeah, 470 amp resistor. And not Q1. Number two. I'm going to use a bit of breadboard wire to sort of get it over to this other side. Actually, I can use connecting to D. So, looking at this diagram, there's our LED D3, which is the output of our, um, our debounced switch. This is going to be Q, okay, and this will be our not Q. So now, if I connect that up, you should see we've got one of the outputs high, and one output, the other output is low, okay, and just before, like we had before, the our Debounced switch is low. Now, when I touch it, oh, I've forgotten one very important connection. I forgot my clock connection. So clock is on pin three. So I'm going to use this white. You notice that now it's not connected to anything, so it's a floating input, and it seems to be flashing between the two very rapidly. Sometimes when I touch it, but it, when I when it settles down, there's always only just one or the other. So I'm going to connect this now onto the output of my gate, making sure that it's actually directly connected to the output of the gate and not just across the LED there. Okay, so now it's stable, I can touch it and it doesn't seem to affect it. Now if I touch this, it changes. Okay. This is what I would expect. One press of my um, switch here should result in one change of my clock.
clock uh, of my flip flop. Now sometimes it doesn't seem to want to be doing it, but okay. Let's just see if it's just not debounced well enough. There we go. Okay, so I'll slow it down using the hundred K. If you're having problems with it, um, not uh, like it looks like you're getting multiple presses, you could do the same thing. Just increase that resistor value a bit more than the 10K that it was, and, um, and that should work fine for you. Okay, so looking at the behavior of this, I, uh, we're gonna use something called a timing diagram, and on our timing diagram here, every vertical dashed line that we've got is, a, um, is an event, so, it's not like a necessarily a linear time scale along horizontally. It's a, um, a event-based time scale. And so every time something is changing, um, it's gonna correspond with one of those vertical lines. So here, if I were to press the, um, press the switch together, the, this is the output of our uh, debounce switch circuit. So pressing the switch, which is going to change the output of our debounce switch from low to high. Well, that's a different event than the output of our debounce switch going from high to low. So we record them on separate times. And I, uh, because we know the behavior of our clocking signal, I can complete this whole uh, clock timing diagram like so. Okay, so now, if we've got it set up at the moment, you can see that um, at the moment, the in clock input is low, Q is high, and not Q is low. So this is what we've uh, currently got at the moment. And so we've got our clock low, Q is high, and not Q is low. And then when I press the switch, I'm gonna press and hold it so we don't get this uh, second event happening. You can see that now Q has gone low, Q bar has gone high, and the clock input is high. So that's how I re represent that on my timing diagram. So I just draw that change there. So you can see that Q has gone low, not Q went high, and our clock went high. Okay. And then if I release it, you notice that nothing changed. We've still got Q low, we've still got not Q high, but now the clock is low, okay? So we can leave, we can record that as is our clock has gone back low again, but Q stayed low and not Q stayed high. Repeating that, I'm gonna do a full cycle. So clock went high, then low. Q went high and stayed high, not Q went low and stayed low. So I'd represent that on my timing diagram, like clock went high, then low, Q went high and stayed high, Q bar went low and stayed low. Okay, and you can see that this, this is just gonna cycle through this pattern. Okay, so every time I press that, I get a change on here. Only one change though, it takes two changes to get it back to the original state. Okay. And so you can represent that on this timing diagram by completing it like this. Okay, so to answer the questions in the analysis, um, so comparing the frequencies, so you can see the frequencies, so how many times does the does Q change? Um, well, how many cycles of clock here. So a cycle would be a low to high and back to low again. It's a full cycle. So how many cycles of, um, of Q do you get for every cycle of the clock? And you see that it's a half. So it only changes a half of a cycle. So we, or we, or the other way you can think of it is we need two cycles of our clock to get a full cycle of Q. So Q to go from low to high and back to low again. 
That's four of these timing event boxes, which is two cycles of clock. Okay. So we could say that the frequency, which is the number of cycles per unit time or per unit, is going to, of Q is going to be half of that of the clock. And you can think of that as being a divide by two operation. You'll also notice that, uh, to answer question three here, how is the logic state on Q related to the logic state on D? So there's two ways we can think about this. So D is connected to, with a piece of wire, it's connected to not Q. And so the logic state on D must be the same as the logic state on Q, because it's just connected together with a bit of wire. And so, um, and, and Q bar is always the opposite of Q. So that's what Q bar means, or not Q. And so uh, D, which is the same as Q bar, is always going to be the opposite of Q. And you could write that as a Boolean statement, D is equal to not Q. The other way you can think of it, and this is based on the operation of how a D-type flip-flop works, is that... Um, Whenever this clock input here sees a rising edge or positive going edge, then whatever the logic state on D goes on to log, uh, Q. So if D is a zero, then Q after that clocking event will go to a zero, will stay a zero. If D is a one, then Q will become a one, will stay a one. And because Q and Q bar are always opposite, then the we see that that Q will always change or toggle when um, D oh, on a clocking event. Okay. Now, if we remove that 10 microfarad debouncing capacitor, what we'll see is that it's going to become unreliable. Okay. Now, I've, I've removed the capacitor, and you can see that I can't get very easily it to change just the once. Okay. So, even if it does toggle from one to the other, it seems to flash a bit too because I'm pressing it multiple times. It's very difficult to actually get it to just do one. And so this capacitor here adds that debounce effect that we need for a mechanical switch. And now I can reliably, well, yeah, there we go, reliably get it to change just the once. Okay. So it makes it unreliable and count potentially multiple times for each switching event. Okay, now we're going to add the second flip-flop to the circuit. So I'm just going to build that. I'll disconnect the power so I don't accidentally damage anything. And we're going to modify it to look just like this. You notice here now that we haven't got an LED on Q bar anymore. So I'm going to remove that. And I'm going to be using the second flip-flop in the IC. So uh, in our flip-flop here, we've got two, uh, in our IC, we've got two flip-flops, one and two, and I'm going to be using the second one. Okay, so just like before, I'm going to connect um, my reset pins up first. I'm going to remove that first. Floating input behavior there, which is what we'd expect. So now, if I connect that to not Q of the previous circuit, when this goes from high to low, not Q goes from low to high, and that should make this change. So, if I do this, it should change this one, this one go to low. So it looks like it's behaving. Good. So some of the things I was um, having trouble with, if you're getting un weird behaviour like this, oh, now it's not doing it. If it goes high and low with the uh, with the clock input, you've probably disconnected the power supply accidentally. So let's just check that. You can see now that it behaves. Okay. All right.
So now we've built that circuit, I can um, model the behaviour or go through the behaviour again. And just like before, we're going to be looking at um, these clocking events. So the clock here is when input clock input goes high to low. So that's the output of our um, our debound switch. So when it goes from low to high, that's one event. And when it goes from high to low, that's another event. Okay. And you can see that the behavior of that first flip-flop, so we just ignore the top one here for the moment, it goes, it follows the behavior, so this bottom one follows the behavior of the, just like it did before, okay? Nothing changed, because that's still just a D-type flip-flop set to toggle. Okay, so now, let's uh, get it back to our initial state. So my initial state that I had this set up with is zero, zero. So if my clock input's low, Q is low and not Q, and Q, so Q1 is low and Q2 is low. So we've got clock input low, Q1 low, Q2 low. Okay. Now after the first clocking event, We see that the, Q, the clock goes high low. Q1 goes high and stays high. And Q2 stay, is stays low. So we can represent that on this time diagram like this. So Q clock goes high low. Q1 goes high and stays high. Q2 stays low. Now if I repeat the same again, you can see that now Q1 goes back to low, and Q2 changes to high. So we could represent that with this part of the clock diagram, this timing diagram here. So we've got clock goes high, low, Q1 changes, and Q2 also changes. Repeat it again. And now you see that both have gone high, so Q1 changed, Q2 did not change. And so that could be represented that can be represented on this part of the timing diagram where we've got the clock goes high low, Q1 goes high and stays high, and Q2 stays high. Now, if I repeat it again, you can see both go low. Okay? And so we can complete, complete the timing diagram here, and you'll notice that uh, Q2, um, each sort of pulse is four boxes, or you could say each cycle is eight full boxes. So uh, what we're getting for the clock, a full cycle is two boxes, Q1 is four boxes, and Q2 is eight boxes for a full cycle. Okay. Q1 changes when the clock goes from low to high. Okay. So this is why this is because this is a positive going edge on the clock input there. Okay. So when the, this is our clock, it goes from low to high. So that causes this flip-flop here to toggle, to change. Okay, so Q1 changes from zero to one. And IC1B, which is the second flip-flop in, uh, in this circuit, so this is the second flip-flop. Um, that is clocked, if you look here, you can see it's clocked from, not Q, of the previous flip-flop. So from not Q, one. From not Q, one. Okay, so let's just um, go through and look at the, um, the four possible states of, the, uh, of this counter. And we're gonna represent it in this sort of binary way. So the most significant bit it corresponds to, to Q2 here, okay? So when this LED is a zero, the most significant bit is a zero. If the LED is on, it's a one, that's a one, okay? And let's just start when they're both low. Okay, so that when both Q1 and Q2 were low, okay? Q1 and Q2 were low. 
We're just going to concatenate these together. So zero, zero is the binary number, and that corresponds with a zero in decimal. Now after the first clock pulse, so the first count event if you like, we've got zero, 01. So zero, 01, and that's a one in, binary, in decimal. Okay. Then we've got a one, zero. <laughs> we've got a one we've got a one zero, which is one zero in binary, don't say ten. And that's a two in decimal. And finally, we know both high, uh, there we are, both high. So one one. And that's a three in decimal. Okay. You notice here that when, um, what does the counter do when it completes this full 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 cycle? It goes back to 0, 0. So it loops back to 0, 0. Okay. And so this is a counter. Um, this is a counter that counts from 0 through to 3 in decimal, or 0, 0 to 1, 1 in binary. And it just keep looping around like that, in the same sort of way that a clock. If you think about the, uh, the, the numbers on a clock, they go from 1 to 12 and then back to 1 again. Okay? It just keeps looping around in, those, in that sequence. Right. So we would say this has, uh, it's got four different uh, possible states, so it's got a modulus of 4, and the count is 0 to 3. Um, so with these ripple counters, so this is what we call a ripple counter, because the you can see a picture, the changes are going to ripple through the circuit. So this will change, and that will cause this to change, and which will then cause this one to change, because there's this sort of sequential this relies on the output of the first one changing. Okay, and so the, the changes are going to ripple through the circuit. The reality is that the um, there is a finite amount of time. These things aren't instant, and we call that the propagation delay. So the time between the clock input of this seeing this go from low to high, and the output here actually changing, is it's very small, like it's in nanoseconds, but uh, it's finite. And it's important um, to consider it for some things. So the outputs of the ripple counter don't change all at the same time because the flip-flops take some time to change once the positive going edge is detected. Now there aren't any real benefits to this other than simplicity. So it's a simple counter circuit to make. So that's a benefit maybe. And it could be a problem and it only really becomes apparent when you would think about if I were to have a logic gate that was connected to both of these two outputs here. So if I were to connect an AND gate to both of these two things, when this is a 1, 1, that would make my AND gate um, have an output of 1. And what I might find is that the, um, the output is not the same, or not the same logic as I would expect based on what the inputs, or the output of my counter should be, okay? Uh, actually, a, a great example is if we had an XOR gate. So remember an XOR gate, the output is high if the inputs are different. If I connect both of these to an XOR gate, all right, if this was a 0, 1, we would expect the output to be high. If this was a 1, 1, we would expect the output of that XOR gate to be low because they're both one. And the next count after this, so if I press the button again, 
The next count is 0, 0, which is also the same, and so I'd expect the uh, output of my XOR gate to stay low. The reality is, though, this changes before this one changes, and so the output of my XOR gate might be high for just for a very short amount of time, and we call that a glitch. And that glitch, if that XOR gate was, say, the input to another counter, it might actually register that as a pulse and cause it to count where you don't want it to count, and that could be a problem, maybe. So, potential for logic connected to counter outputs to have momentarily so momentarily incorrect outputs called a glitch So the function block diagram of the 2-bit counter would look something like this. Um, I'm going to draw it down the bottom here on this page. So we have a switch as my input. Okay. We're going to have a LEDs showing binary count. Binary value, uh, count, yeah. LED is showing binary counter state. Okay, this is going to be my output. Notice I was starting with the input and the output. So the first thing that we had for this circuit was a debounce. Okay, so we debounced our switch. And then I can represent this in a uh, single block because this we call a two-stage binary ripple counter. Okay, and just connecting them together. You can see we've got our switch, which we debounce, and that goes into a two-stage binary ripple counter, and the output from that is the LED showing the binary counter state. And that would be the function block diagram for this counter. 